So I'm back with Professor Morris at UCL talking about genetics of Parkinson's. Um, so last time we talked about, I guess, general genetic forms of Parkinson's. So, so the question is, how can that help us develop better therapies for Parkinson's, not, not just for people with the genetic variants, but people with idiopathic Parkinson's as well? I think that's obviously a really important question. And obviously we're interested in the biology, but the main reason for doing this research is to develop, is to develop, uh, is to develop new treatments. First of all, I mean, we talk about, we know a lot from major genes that, that you know, dramatically increase the, 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 the chance of disease. And you can use genetic variation in major genes to do cell models, to animal models, to try out new therapies. So this is like LARC2, GBA, exactly. SNCA, things exactly, like that. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. There is an over, one of the things that is there is an overlap between these major factors and the common risk factors. So actually the same genes often have variants in them that slightly increase the risk. They also have major variants that dramatically increase the risk. So there's okay. kind of a spectrum of risk at the same bits of the genome. So we think there is an overlap, but obviously we don't know for sure whether the whether the, the, the therapies develop, developed based on major genes are going to be applicable for everyone with Parkinson's. So that's an important thing. The two the, t- the two main targets at the moment are this gene LARC2, LRRK2. So this is a um, this is a protein which is a kinase, so it adds phosphate groups to other other proteins. It kind of really acts as kind of like a messenger in the cells, sort of triggering some chemical reactions. Um, we know that that kinase, that that um, that that signaling mechanism, is overactive in people who carry this LERT2 variant. So there are actually two approaches that are being taken forward at the moment. One is to reduce the level of the gene to reduce the kinase activity. Um, which is a um, which is a sort of gene therapy that cuts down the level of that of that of that gene. The other type of therapy that's being looked at is um, a tablet which inhibits the uh, activity of that enzyme, so it cuts down that that enzyme activity. Both of these, of course, are trials, so we don't know whether they're going to be effective at the moment. They're being evaluated to see whether they're safe, um, compared to patients taking placebo. But I think that's kind of a promising approach because it's based on a genetic cause that we know for Parkinson's. So for somebody who's got that particular genetic variant, that's helpful. But does that help people with, with different types of Parkinson's? Yeah, we don't, well, we don't know that at the moment. Okay. And at the moment, that's being evaluated both in people with the genetic variant and without the genetic variant. So both groups are being looked at. We don't really know whether there's a common mechanism that's applying to everybody, but that can only really be evaluated through through clinical trials. The, the second gene that's being looked at is this GBA mm. gene, glucoserine residase. So this is an enzyme that's sort of important in the waste disposal mechanism yeah. in ler- nerve cells, the lysosomal system. And so there are uh, there's a new ther- there's a new trial that's going to start uh, in the UK. Uh, over the next year or so, I think, the ASPRO PD study um, using this drug called Ambroxol, which is, a, uh, which, is a, which is a treatment that helps with kind of trafficking the enzyme through the cell and, and delivering the enzyme to the right, to the right place. So this, is again, the, this is the cough medicine, isn't it? Medicine. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, and again, I'm, I'm not directly involved with that, but I believe that that, is going to, that trial is going to happen both in people who carry the genetic variant some people don't carry the genetic variant relevant to that. To answer the question that you're kind of directly asking, is it just for people with a gene variant or is it for other patients as well? It is true that we've done quite a lot of trials in Parkinson's, trying to stop it get, getting worse, which have not been effective over the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah. There have been many, many trials that so far have not been effective. I think that actually um, the ability to do trials that are based on some really firm biology about genes that increase risk of disease, I think that's a much firmer footing. And I'm sort of cautiously optimistic that one of these types of approaches may be helpful based on what we know about the biology of disease. I think it means that therapies are going forward with a much firmer, firmer footing. So so this leads us to a kind of an, an interesting question, which is, is there broadly one mechanism in Parkinson's or are there actually distinct types of Parkinson's that have different underlying biochemical mechanisms? I think there's some evidence that younger people with Parkinson's are more likely to have a mitochondrial problem, so problems with the energy production mm. in nerve cells. Uh, older people with Parkinson's are more likely to have a problem with waste disposal in nerve cells. That's a bit. Of, that's a hypothesis, really, that's that's built on the genetic data and also some kind of biochemical tests that have been done in people with Parkinson's. That's not proven, but my feeling would be there are different forms of Parkinson's, and um, 
and that there may be treatments that are particularly applicable to people with certain forms of Parkinson's. That's you know un unproven at the moment. Yeah. yeah, and I think we probably need we probably need better biomarkers, so so blood tests or brain scans that actually define the underlying biochemistry, so the sort of mechanisms that are that are not working properly in Parkinson's. So I think that's an area where there'll be a lot of development over the next 10 years. So we've got the, the alpha synuclein SAA test, I guess, which is quite yeah. new. But you're talking about more nuanced tests that, that look at individual yeah, variations. Although, I mean, although the you, you mentioned the SAA test, so this is this um, test where you look at the, look at the moment either spinal fluid or a skin biopsy and look at whether um, there's, a, there's a substance in the spinal fluid that can trigger the clumping together of synuclein into these insoluble clumps, so whether it can trigger this process. And that's something that seems to be particularly, well, it, it, it's a marker of, of mm. Parkinson's synuclein pathology. Interestingly, between 5 and 10% of people who come to clinic ostensibly have Parkinson's, well, they do have Parkinson's as a, as a condition, do not have this type of um, synuclein seeding Okay, interesting. Reaction. So it kind of all, I mean, it instantly suggests there is a diversity of mechanisms that occur when people come to the clinic. Um, so that does tell us about different groups of people. But so I think that's going to be really important over the next, you know, five years. But I think there'll be other, other tests or things looking for things like mitochondrial production, energy supply, uh, lysosomal waste products. And then there's also this RAB pathway. So this pathway that's that's related to um, the LERP2 gene, which we can now begin to uh, measure. So a difficult question. How many years away are we from understanding some of these genetic forms of Parkinson's properly, like, like LARC2 and GBA, versus the idiopathic, uh, idiopathic Parkinson's, which is probably a bit more complicated to, to get to the bottom yeah. of? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I tend, I, I, first of all, I think we know a lot more about it than we did 10 years ago. Mm. So I think that the, the rate of improvement or increase in our knowledge is kind of exponential in terms of what we're understanding about things. Um, I think that I think as you're sort of suggesting, my kind of belief is that there's a big overlap between the mechanisms and people who've got really strong genetic causes and people who don't. And I think there's gonna there are overlapping mechanisms that are gonna happen in people with no family history and people with a family history, which means that we'll know more about everything. I think um I think I think we do need to understand more about the way that these subtle changes, these risk factors also biochemical pathways so there is going to be more work i, I think it's very difficult to put a to put a sort of you know time, time frame on it time yeah. frame on it um but i think all of this is driving new trials and, and, and you know valuations of potential new treatments which i think is the most important thing so a final question on this topic if, if we have a, a whole list of genetic variants that we know substantially increase the yeah. risk of parkinson's does that give us an opportunity to eradicate those from the family line by, for example, doing IVF reproduction and then screening for those? I think for some severe uh, conditions, we obviously do have a we do have a um, uh, a legal framework in the UK where you can have pre implantation testing um, to see whether your child will have a risk for a severe condition. So Huntington's uh, or something like that, exactly, for example. Exactly. Things like things like Huntington's. I think with things like, I mean, um, it is obviously, uh, you know, people's personal decisions and, and about this in in um, in together with a genetic counsellor and discussing things with um, e experts in um, this type of area. So it is people's personal decision. Broadly speaking, in in families with Parkinson's, there have not been large numbers of people wanting to have either predictive tests, see what's going to happen in the future, yeah. or or kind of preconception or antenatal testing, see what's going to happen in their family. So Parkinson's, although it gets worse over time, tends to respond quite well to treatment. I think the way that it is, is that all of us inherit things from our parents, mm. and some of those things are protective against getting cancer, heart disease, stroke, some of them are risk factors, for getting things like heart disease, cancer, stroke. Most of these things we can't measure at the moment there are you know more gene tests coming forward which there are some gene tests for parkinson's which enable us to or, or other conditions like Huntington's disease or motor neuron disease where we can precisely predict whether you carry this variant and whether you are like to develop something in the future 
Um, for some people, it's very helpful to have that knowledge, but, but most people don't want to know what, what, what the future holds. And particularly where we don't have a preventative treatment. So this may, this may change, of course, if we have a tablet or an injection that prevents things from developing in the future. But at the moment, we don't really have a preventative treatment other than you know, being healthy, having a good diet, taking, taking exercise and so forth. Which for some people, they can make a lifestyle change, but other people are perhaps already quite healthy. So yeah, it doesn't make a difference. Much difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. On that note, thank you very much for your time. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.